In the context of the federal election coming up in a month, we are very lucky and honoured to have with us today Senator the Honourable Erica Betts. He is the Leader of the Opposition in the Senate and importantly for our purposes, Shadow Minister in relation to employment and workplace relations. Previously in the Howard Government, he was a Minister for Fisheries, Forestry and Conservation from 2006 to 2007. Prior to joining Federal Parliament, he was a lawyer at the firm Abetz, Curtis and Dutton in Tasmania. Senator Abetz has kindly agreed to take questions after his address, so if you have any questions for him, you'll have your chance at the end, uh, and again, if you can wait for the roving mics. Without further ado, to, to talk to us about uh, the Coalition's plans for workplace relations under a Coalition Government, Senator Eric Abetz. Thank you very much and it's a uh, pleasure to be with you. When I saw the invitation and saw the agenda for today, I noted that it goes for about 10 hours from 8am to 6pm and uh, I saw the price tag and then I divided that by 10 for the hourly rate and uh, hopefully I can give you $43.50 worth of uh, value uh, during my presentation this morning. Can I confess to you that I am a workplace relations tragic? Uh, this is the portfolio area of my choice and uh, without revisiting unhappier times within the coalition, um, I resigned with Tony Abbott and Senator Nick Minchin at a certain time and that then precipitated a leadership change and having put uh, everything on the line, I said to Tony Abbott, well, there's got to be a reward in this. Um, I want employment and workplace relations and he kindly agreed. Uh, for those of you that are old enough, you may recall the Dollar Sweets case which was seen as a fairly important case in the development of common law and uh, workplace relations uh, that my friends Peter Costello and Michael Kroger worked on and uh, I came over from Tasmania to work on that case for about four weeks straight. And uh, suffice to say, I have had an ongoing interest in matters workplace relations. And there's the technical side that is interesting, but for me, it is a great intersect between economic and social policy. It's also a great intersect between macro and micro economics. You can get all the macro stuff right and have a great, con uh, great economy, but every worker not being able to make their household budget work. Or you can pay every worker gazillions and bankrupt your economy. And so it's always getting that balance to make sure that you've got a good economy along with a good economy in Australian households. And of course, the economic and social policy uh, aspects uh, would be there for you to consider as well. So I find it a very stimulating area. Can I make a couple of general observations? Trade unionists, when they are off the record, business people, when they are off the record, workers, everybody s tell me that we're sick and tired of change. Fatigue, uh, reform fatigue, change fatigue, I think has set in. Uh, in this area. And one of the important things to ensure that an economy works well is to have stability and to have certainty. And so we had the genuinely bizarre situation that at the 2010 election, Simon Crean, who was then Minister for Workplace Relations, and myself as the Shadow Minister, neither of us, neither of us actually announced a policy other than there wouldn't be any change. And of course it's interesting to reflect on that, that which was so sacrosanct, that which was not to be touched at all in this current parliament has had, and those of you that have to read the pages each and every day will be able to tell me that there have been how many hundred pages of amendments during this parliament? 400 pages worth. 
So from having made a promise to the people they wouldn't make any changes and demanding that we make no changes, which we readily agree to, you have been subjected to 400 pages of amendments just in the past three years. So what's the coalition approach? And look, uh, as all good coalitionists have to do, we have to wave our policy document, I understand, to show that we have a plan. And this is it in relation to workplace relations, all 38 pages uh, of it. But what we're seeking to do in this document is to indicate to the Australian people that we will keep the current framework of the Fair Work Act. We will keep uh, the current structure. What we have sought to do in the document is to identify some problems, the practical problems, and then provide practical solutions uh, to those problems. So let me go to some specific issues. First of all, we have said that there will be a judicial inquiry into the Australian Workers' Union scandal of the early 1990s. Hundreds of thousands of dollars are still missing, and when you've got people like the former Labor Attorney-General, Rob McClelland, calling for it, when you've got Fair Work Commissioner, Ian McCambridge, calling for it, I think that there is a very good reason for a uh, inquiry. We have also announced that we would have a Registered Organisations Commission. We did that on the back of the tardiness of the Australian Industrial Relations Commission and then the Fair Work Commission in following up the Health Services Union scandal, which is uh, continuing on, and uh, forgive me if I'm slightly political, but I could not help but note that the Labor Party down south, having reformed itself and purged itself from all these things, has just endorsed in Craig Thompson's seat of Dobell and Emma McBride, who was also in the Health Services Union and who was also on the local council in that electorate. And uh, when an issue relating to Craig Thompson came up, uh, she is alleged to have voted against a motion uh, of no confidence or something in Craig Thompson. So it would appear that she was part of the cheer brigade or the protection uh, brigade for uh, Craig Thompson, but. I'm sure now she's absolutely disgusted uh, by all the activities that took place in the Health Services Union. But look, there have been slush funds in a number of uh, trade unions, regrettably. And it's interesting that once again, off the record, many a trade unionist tells me, Eric, what you're doing in this space is absolutely right because it will preserve the reputation of trade unions in the long term. And it's interesting that Paul Howes of the Australian Workers' Union, and you always do a double take when Paul Howes or somebody like that uh, comes out in support, and you say, look, have I got this right? But I think we have, and I accept Paul Howes' sincerity in this, that he has accepted that which I've put out into the public domain, and it's simply this. If a director of a company rips off shareholders, what is the material or moral difference if a union boss rips off union members' money? And nobody has been able to tell me what the moral or material difference is. But can I tell you, the legislation tells me there's a huge difference. If a union official engages in that behaviour, it's about a $10,000 fine maximum. If a company director does it, five years in jail and up to $300,000 fine. And uh, I'm not sure where the moral or material difference is in the conduct. We therefore say that the penalties should be the same. We also believe that there has to be a more rigorous reporting process. At Senate Estimates I found out that there are some so-called registered organisations with them that have not put in financial returns for 10 years but are still on the books. I accept the chances are that organisation in particular is defunct, but they should be cleaned out and cleansed from the registers so that everything is prim and proper in relation to registered organisations. And when I talk registered organisations, I'm talking trade unions, 
and employer organisations. However, the sad story is that out of the 18 current inquiries being undertaken by the Fair Work Commission, only one of them relates to an employer organisation. So you can see where the imbalance is in relation to uh, improper conduct. So what we want to have is a registered organisations commission that will be an independent, separate node within the Fair Work Ombudsman, but uh, that's where they'll be housed, but they will be absolutely separate and independent to be able to uh, pursue, pursue uh, matters of integrity within uh, employer organisations. We have also announced the Australian Building and Construction Commission will uh, come back again and we will ensure in the event that there is any doubt and uh, it's amazing how the wonderful world of the law works but there was some doubt whether offshore platforms were actually covered by the Australian Building and Construction uh, Commission and legislation and some people say it depends if the platform is only anchored as opposed to somehow drilled and affixed to the uh, sea floor. I don't pretend to understand it, but to ensure that we cover everything we have announced in our policy, that it will cover um, offshore platforms as well. You here in Queensland have had the uh, ugly situation at the Queensland Children's Hospital, and if I recall correctly, eight weeks of strike that should not have occurred. We saw the ugly scenes at the Meyer Emporium in Victoria where Grocon was subjected to a strike and picket, uh, court injunctions ignored and uh, good on Daniel Grollo for taking uh, the union to court and suing for damages because here was a situation where members of the CFMEU collected a bit of money and put an advertisement in the Herald Sun newspaper publicly calling on their trade union leadership to stop harassing them and allow them to get to and from work without intimidation because they, as the workers and employees of Grocon, had no dispute with Grocon. Now, when a trade union leadership can be so divorced from their actual members on a work site, you know certain things are wrong and uh, we believe that that sort of ugly, divisive activity has no place in workplace relations uh, in this day and age. Now, one of the arguments against the Australian Building and Construction Commission is that every worker should be subjected to the same laws and nobody should be treated better than anybody else, or for that matter, worse than anybody else. Can I say in relation to the powers of the Australian Building and Construction Commission, they are applied and can be applied without fear or favour. In other words, just as much as a trade union official could be hauled in to give some evidence, so can employers and contractors, and in the past, that is exactly what happened. But the Labor Party will tell you that you should have the one law apply to all. And I must say, on the face of it, in principle, it sort of looks like a good idea. But then, why do they have and support special legislation for the textile, clothing and footwear sector where union officials, something which we support by the way, are actually given extra powers in that sector to ensure that workers who are more likely to be ripped off in that sector are given extra protection. So the union movement cannot have it both ways and we say in principle it is good to have one law for everybody but if there is a particular need in a sector, be it in the textile, clothing and footwear sector, to make sure that especially immigrant workers are protected from being ripped off, well, you give extra powers and support in that area and if in another area, such as in the building and construction sector, you have huge evidence, courtesy of the Coal Royal Commission, that there is thuggery, lawlessness, intimidation, etc., taking place, then it makes good sense to have a specialist body dealing with that. Let me turn to right of entry laws. Julia Gillard at the National Press Club, as the shadow spokesman in my position, uh, before the 2007 election, promised 
that there would be no change to the right of entry laws. Indeed, so adamant was she that she said you could take her mother as a hostage, as a guarantee. Well, I'm not sure what she thinks of her mother, but huge changes were made and what we have basically said in our policy that we will implement Labor's forward with fairness when it comes to right of entry, in other words, keeping the situation as it was in 2007, other than we believe it would make sense if, like a driver's licence, a card was actually issued with a uh, photo identification on it. And, uh, but that is our view in relation to right of entry. Yeah, it is no coincidence that as soon as the Fair Work Bill became the Fair Work Act, one work site in Western Australia had 200 right of entry visits, not in the first 200 days or the first 100 days, but in the first 90 days, 200 visits. Now, was that done for genuine purposes? I think not. That was done to flex muscle, to intimidate, to show that they were back in business, that they had been re-empowered, and it was all designed to intimidate. That is not good for anybody, and uh, we believe that Julia Gillard actually did get it right when she said in 2007 that there should be no change. In relation to small business, some of them are disappointed that we won't be moving in the unfair dismissal area. We are willing to watch and wait as to the changes that the Fair Work Commission has made and the government uh, try to inculcate in relation to question of costs and also trying to steer people away from the adversarial system and we'll see what happens there. Penalty rates, another big issue, but one thing we won't be getting into as a government is to try to legislate awards. As soon as you start legislating on one aspect of an award, be it penalty rates, why not the length of a lunch, lunch hour or lunch break or morning tea break or commencement time or what danger money should be paid when you're working on a sixth or twelfth floor of a building or uh, you know, all the other uh, raft of issues that are involved in the modern awards. They, that should be the province of the Fair Work Commission. The Fair Work Commission as the independent umpire should be determining that in a fair, balanced manner after hearing all the evidence from all the witnesses and uh, respondents to the particular issue at stake. Now, having said that, there is no doubt that the Fair Work Commission and our federal court has been stacked and packed like you would not believe. And uh, that has led to the Fair Work Commission being somewhat discredited. Just recently, I got a note from a... Uh, industrial relations bar uh, barrister who told, told me, Eric, we're off to the High Court. And I said, oh, why is that? He said, can you believe this for luck? Fair Work Commissioner, first instance, then the full Fair Work Commission of three, Federal Court Judge, and he had just drawn the full Federal Court of three. All eight of those quasi and judicial officers all had a particular background, I'll leave it at that, and he knew that he simply would not have his argument heard properly. Now, if that is the feeling by a distinguished industrial barrister and he's drawn that sort of a panel each and every time, it is a matter of concern and the reputation of the Fair Work Commission, I believe, has been tarnished. It was like when Jeff Lawrence, the former ACTU secretary, agreed to go so quietly when they hip and shouldered him out of the job. I made the prediction, watch this space, he will be appointed to the Fair Work Commission. Yep, he was hip and shouldered out in about December last year. He was appointed in March of this year. And when you can predict those sort of outcomes, you know that the selection process might have certain uh, flaws in it and uh, the results are there for all to see. Can I quickly move on to individual flexibility arrangements because we do want to flesh them out to make them more workable. We believe that individual flexibility arrangements should be individual and flexible, subject to the better off overall test. In other words, the worker has to be better off. 
Now, somehow, Bill Shorten and Jed Carney have told the Australian people, or try to tell, I should say, because no journalist took them seriously, they asserted that this was pizzas for penalties. This was the end of penalty rates, and you know, who would be a, quote, idiot, idiot, to think of providing a non-monetary benefit in exchange for penalty rates. It all sounded really good until I was able to point out to Bill Shorten, Jed Carney and more importantly the Australian media that trading non-monetary benefits in individual flexibility arrangements was actually countenanced in Julia Gillard's own legislation and in her explanatory memorandum to the legislation. Indeed, under Labor, the Fair Work Ombudsman has on their website, in relation to individual flexibility arrangements, that you can do exactly that. And as a result, uh, the ACTU and Bill Shorten attack uh, fell short, and we simply say, in response to their attempted attack, why is it that you don't want individual workers to be better off overall, because that is the test. It can only be legal if the person is better off overall. With underpaid workers, I've always believed it's an anomaly that when the Fair Work Ombudsman collects money for unpaid workers and then tries to find them, that money goes into the general revenue of the government and the government gets the benefit of the interest. And so when, after six or 12 months, they finally find the worker, they just pay the worker the cash that they collected without the interest earned on it. We believe that any interest earned on that money should go to the benefit of the worker. The JJ Richards case, strike first, talk later, was something that was specifically ruled out by Kevin Rudd. That would not be allowed under the Fair Work Act. Well, I think the JJ Richards case told us something different. In those circumstances, I said, look, when you have new legislation, you can have muck-ups. Accept that. So, Labor, if you want to amend the Fair Work Act, we will expedite it through the Parliament so that the legislation actually represents that which you promised the Australian people. And there was stony silence, no response. I then started asking, well, was this in the Fair Work Act deliberately or by accident, and we never got an answer to that. So it seems to me that in typical style of the current Prime Minister, one thing was said and something completely different was delivered. We believe that strike first, talk later is not the proper way to go about workplace relations. You shouldn't be able to drop a $100,000 wage increase on the table, fold your arms and say, look, we're into good faith bargaining. We now want the right for a protected action ballot. Uh, that is not the way to conduct workplace relations. So before protected action ballots can be undertaken, the Fair Work Commission under us would need to satisfy itself that there has been a proper discussion, that the claim isn't too outrageous, and there has been discussion about uh, productivity. We'll have the Productivity Commission undertake a full review of the Fair Work Act. It was not submitted to what uh, is usually required, namely a regulatory impact statement. And then if you don't have a regulatory impact statement when you introduce legislation, you have to have a review within two years. The department drafted a wonderful terms of reference that Bill Shorten put his red pen through, deleted references to productivity and other things. He then handpicked a panel and uh, that hand-picked panel with skewed terms of reference, might I say, did a surprisingly good job in a whole host of areas, and we've adopted a lot of their recommendations in this policy, recommendations that Bill Shorten's run away from. But having said that, having said that, uh, it was a disappointing review, and we believe a full and proper review should be undertaken. And can I simply remind you the Productivity Commission I believe is economically robust, yet socially sensitive, as witnessed by their work on the National Disability Insurance Scheme. So I believe the Australian population does have uh, the right to have a confidence in the Productivity Commission undertaking that work. I could go on with a number of uh, 
other issues, but if I may, I'll leave it at that and uh, take some questions. Thanks very much. Uh, perhaps um, if you can raise your hand, we can get a microphone to you. If anybody, there must be some questions, surely. Yes, over this side. Thank you. My question is just in relation to the harmonised safety laws that have been in place around the country for the last 18 months or so, with the majority of states and territories signing up. Do you see that that's been a good thing, and do you see or foresee any major changes? That's a very good question. The idea of having harmonised laws um, is, in principle, a good idea. In fact, it was the Howard government that initiated the move, and the history of that was we had absolutely repugnant laws south of the border here in New South Wales, and so the push was on if you could get uh, uniform laws around the country, you could roll out the New South or roll over the New South Wales laws. Unfortunately, the Australian people made a few decisions at ballot boxes thereafter, and we then had wall-to-wall -wall Labor governments that then uh, worked extremely quickly to uh, get this so-called harmonised uh, legislation through. Um, the government, and you will recall Julia Gillard saying, you know, public servants actually cried. This was her greatest achievement. After all these years, we've finally been able to get harmonised laws. Well, if you call that harmony, I would hate them to be conducting a symphony orchestra. Because Western Australia's not on board, Victoria's not on board, um, New South Wales has got bits and pieces added to it, which still allows the unions uh, some capacity to uh, prosecute matters, and uh, therefore we do still have a hodgepodge system, um, a patchwork quilt uh, system uh, around Australia. Now, the great difficulty with these matters is that, and I'm still so waxing and waning how we fully go forward on this, but. Uh, you know, Victoria had a study undertaken where it would cost Victoria a substantial amount of money because the vast bulk of their businesses are only operating within the state of Victoria. And the Victorian system, they believe, is better and cheaper and whatever for uh, workplaces. And to prejudice all those small businesses for those like Linfox that operate interstate is a matter of... Uh, some concern. And I suppose coming from Tasmania and might strike a chord here in Queensland, I actually believe to a certain extent in competitive federalism. I sometimes ponder what would have happened if J.B. Elkie Peterson with death duties said, oh, I've got the idea, I'll put it on the COAG agenda. You know what? It'll still be on the COAG agenda today, having moved up to item 99. You know, nothing would have been done about it. He just did it and forced every other state to follow suit because he gained such a huge economic advantage for his state. And if I might say, the Victorian legislation to me, as it stands, looks pretty good. And without boring you with all the detail, there are uh, the, uh, what the, uh, the control test that was removed. There is still some vagueness about all that from the questions I've asked, but without banging on for too long, I asked the question, and this was the answer I was given. The question was, I own a bit of land. I appoint a property manager who appoints a builder who appoints a subcontractor who's an electrician, and the electrician gets electrocuted. Was it reasonably foreseeable by me as the property owner that if I build something with electricity in it or on it or around it, that somebody might get electrocuted. Yes, that is reasonably foreseeable. Therefore, I had a degree of responsibility and I cannot contract out of that responsibility. So as a result, I've got to take a degree of care, take out insurance, as does the property manager, as does the uh, master builder or the uh, top building contractor, as does the subcontractor. It seems to me that that sort of 
bureaucracy and red tape and trying to cover every possible eventuality is what is stifling our economy. So I wouldn't mind having a look at some of these things, but the concept is good just as long as we don't swamp small business for the benefit of a few big businesses. And look, when I say that, I accept that the big <coughs> businesses are the ones that are generating a lot of the wealth of the country. So, you know, the big business category might only be, you know, a couple of hundred or a thousand businesses, but I accept that they do general, generate a lot of economic wealth and jobs, and we need to look after them as well. But I think we need to get the balance. Senator, does the coalition have a, a view in relation to uh, the changes put through by uh, the federal government in late last year in relation to transfer of business uh, as it applies to state entities outsourcing or, or selling off uh, parts of their businesses, trying to um, uh, retain industrial instruments with employees as they move into the private sector? Thank you for that question. Those of you that are real junkies would know that recommendation 38 of the Fair Work Review Panel, uh, Fair Work Act Review Panel, was that the transfer of business uh, provisions need to be streamlined because at the moment it's a lose-lose. The acquiring business is basically better off to get rid of the workforce and as a result the acquiring business loses the corporate knowledge of those workers and of course the other losses, workers lose their jobs and aren't able to make the transition to the new employer. There was one of the reasons, often regrettably, that you have a transfer of business or an acquisition of business etc is that the workplace relations of a particular business is such that they cannot make ends meet and uh, if you then want to import that into the acquiring business well, guess what? They're not going to acquire the business. And in Queensland, you had special legislation rushed through by, if I might say, the most partisan workplace relations minister we've had in a very, very long time, that Bill Shorten rushed this through, trying to make all sorts of political comments. In fact, he flew up to Queensland to make the announcement that he was going to have legislation to try to stifle Campbell Newman. And wasn't it great to see the employment figures uh, come up, or in other words, unemployment go down uh, in your state uh, yesterday, which indicates that sometimes when you take tough decisions, there are the benefits that flow on afterwards. But that aside, Bill Shorten, in the most partisan way, came up here to announce what he was doing and turned a blind eye to the Abbey Group uh, a children's hospital dispute that had been going on for already a number of weeks at that time. That was of no interest to him, that there was an illegal strike blockade, etc. That was of no interest but cheap politics against Campbell Newman. And when I asked about this legislation in the Senate, it was confirmed to me that if I were a cleaner employed at a school by the Department of Education and they then outsourced that to a private contractor, and the private contractor uh, advertised for a worker, and I applied for the job saying, look, I already work here, I know all the ins and outs, employ me, employ me. They'd say, yep, lovely, but we can't afford all the public service conditions, so we're not going to employ you until after the three months has elapsed. How silly is that? And that is what Bill Shorten's legislation allowed for and basically what it meant was that a lot of public servants could not immediately go into the private sector and had to have this hiatus period of three months. For whose benefit was that? Bill Shorten's front page story on the Courier Mail, but that was about it. So we believe that the recommendations of the review panel, which would overcome that as well, makes good sense for the corporate knowledge to be transferred and for workers, or most of the workers, to be able to keep their employment. Having said that, it's got to be a genuine transfer of business and you can't do the funny stuff with subsidiaries within your own group of companies, etc. And the High Court and others have ruled on that and we wouldn't seek to change that.
Any more questions? Thanks, Jim. Senator, Senator, you've got a, a perhaps what some would describe as a, a modest uh, agenda of change, but notwithstanding that change and some sensible change coming through or planned, uh, what's your sense of how quickly you'll be able to get those changes made, and I guess more particularly getting it through the Senate? Well, thank you for that question. You've got me onto my favourite topic. As leader uh, of the coalition in the Senate, one thing that continually frustrates me is that when we had the Liberal National Parties had a majority in the Senate from 2004 and 2007 for three years. We were accused of trashing the Senate and its role because every now and then we what's called guillotined legislation through the Senate. We would say, look, enough's enough, we're going to put it to the vote. And we did that 32 times in three years. And all the scribes and the ABC in particular used to condemn us for this outrageous abuse of numbers in the Senate. Well, what these same journalists and commentators simply are unable to report to you, I'm sure their keypads must get jammed each time they try to write about it, because that'd be the only reason they don't tell you this. The Green Labor Alliance have had the majority in the Senate since 2010, and Guess how many bills they've guillotined in this term of parliament? It's not 32, it's not 64, it's not 96, it is 216. 216. And in the last week of the parliament, and this is the greatest disgrace of all, in the last week of the parliament, when Kevin Rudd was still leader and they thought they were gone for all money, they guillotined. 55 bills in one week. One and a half times the number that we did in three years, the Labor Green Alliance guillotined in one week. And then you've got the Greens saying, trust us, we'll be the custodians of the Senate. They will abuse their power more so, and if you want to call it an abuse, by sevenfold to what the Liberal National Parties did when we had uh, a majority in the Senate. So sorry that I went off on that tangent, but what I'm saying to you, if I might say, is this, that the Liberal National Parties will always be the best, better custodians of the Senate and its traditions and its task of reviewing legislation than the Green Labor Accord or Alliance. Having said all that, if the Green Labor Alliance maintain it, their majority in the Senate, I dare say we will be substantially frustrated with our agenda. And that is why I make a plea to everybody in this room and wherever I go to remind them that they get two ballot papers, one for the House of Representatives, very important that we change the government and the policy direction of our nation, but you won't be able to do that and achieve that unless you trust us with your Senate vote as well, and please don't diverge when you get your Senate ballot paper to go to your Christian Democrats family first, or indeed up here you've got PUP, what a pa Palmer United Party, or the Catter Party, or whatever else. Because when it comes to respecting the role of the Senate, you've had the experience of the Liberal National Parties, and you've had the experience of the Green Labor Alliance in controlling the Senate, 32 guillotines compared to 216. Who would you rather trust? So what Labor will do, I have no idea, but some of this, like the ABCC, the Registered Organisations Commission for us, is core business, and it will depend very largely on uh, what Labor and Green do in the Senate, not only in relation to these bills, but also the carbon tax, the mining tax, and a few other issues. And Tony Abbott, of course, has said, if need be, we will go to a double dissolution. Uh, Senator, just picking up on the work health and safety uh, issues, um, do you and or the coalition have a view on companies and company officers being able to take out insurance which would purport to cover them for the penalties and liabilities uh, under the model legislation? Uh, particularly in light of a recent case in South Australia where a magistrate was heavily critical 
of the company director who was lying, relying upon an indemnity that he had under a policy and refused to give any discount uh, to penalty even though there was a plea of, of guilty very early on in the proceedings. Well, there you go. I thought I was a workplace relations junkie. I confess I have not caught up with that case or the details around it and uh, I wouldn't seek to pontificate from this lectern about that matter uh, without fully understanding it. Uh, so, I'm sorry. Uh, what program is it that you can pass? Pass on? Ed, Eddie Maguire's uh, program. What's that called? Hot seat, yeah. So although I'm not sitting, I'm standing. If I may, I'll pass on that one. And if you've got a business card um, later on, I'd be uh, interested in uh, making contact and uh, finding out a bit more. I'm one of the partners of the firm, so I'm sure we Ah, <laughs> very well connected. Thanks, Jeremy. Um, any other questions? We have time for perhaps one or, one or two more. I'd like to ask the Senator, um, um, Senator Betts, um, do you feel that workplace relations as an issue is going to uh, loom larger towards the, the, the towards the election, or do you think that it's it's something that's already been dealt with to death? You talked about about issue fatigue before. Do you think that it's at that stage now where it really doesn't have much traction within the uh, electorate? In general terms, I think uh, m most Australians are satisfied that any change that will come from us will be evolution rather than revolution. We've set it out now. Can't believe it. It was three months ago that I stood up with Tony Abbott launching this policy. It's been out there. I've had a uh, debate with uh, Bill Shorten, and I won't mention the name of the legal firm that sponsored that one, but uh, down in Melbourne, and uh, ABC 24 broadcast it live. Um, I've had a debate with Bill Shorten um, at an AMA conference. Indeed, the legal firm that hosted us in Melbourne for the debate also wanted to host us in Sydney, and Bill Shorten squibbed it. Um, if I might say, uh, Melbourne went relatively well as far as I was concerned, and I dare say uh, Bill Shorten thought that uh, chances are Sydney wouldn't be a good idea. So, uh, look, having said that, with not many feathers to fly with, and uh, I will be partisan here, but it is the fact, you know, you've had one term of Labor that was that bad, they got rid of the first term Prime Minister before the election. They then had a second term, and they got rid of the second term Prime Minister before the election, who she was that bad, to go back to the first Prime Minister again. So, you know, they can't actually go to the election selling their record of six years, because if they do, it begs the question, why did you get rid of Kevin Rudd? Why did you get rid of Julia Gillard if things went so swimmingly under their leadership? So what do they revert to? In my home state of Tasmania, it's a fear campaign that Tony Abbott's going to cut $600 million of GST funding from Tasmania. And of course, me as leader of the coalition in the Senate will just allow that to happen without a squawk, you know. Really, nobody believes that that will happen. They will run a scare campaign on workplace relations, but so far, when Jed Carney, when Bill Shorten have tried it, they've spun their wheels, they haven't got any traction on the issue, and I don't think they will because uh, I, I believe our policy is well targeted, it deals with genuine issues, and you know, it's bizarre that with registered organisations, you can point to both Simon Crean and Paul Howes actually supporting the intent of what we want to do. A large part of this document is made up of the recommendations of Labor's hand-picked panel with skewed terms of reference as to changes that should be made to the Fair Work Act, and we've adopted them. So hardly controversial, and as a result, not very fertile ground for Bill Shorten to be able to plough or indeed uh, any other Labor Party uh, official or trade union official. Having said that, be assured there will be a campaign funded by the trade union movement. And if I can just make this observation, I think it is a genuine pity that the trade union movement sees the Labor Party, and sure, historically, the Labor Party grew out of the union movement, but basically, no matter what Labor does, the trade union movement will always be on Labor's side. And uh, 
I had an experience at the last election, and I'll finish on this note. A big burly fella came up to me. I was campaigning in dark red uh, area, as in a labour area in my home city of Hobart, up the northern suburbs at a shopping centre trying to hand out stuff for a good Liberal candidate who was never going to win. But we were doing, doing it and showing, uh, flying the flag. This big burly CFMEU fella came up and said, hey, have a squiz at this. That was his CFMEU membership card. And I said, hmm, this is interesting. I'm sort of not all that well built and thought, uh, what's going to happen here? And then out of his jacket pocket, he pulled something that had a Liberal Party logo on it. I said, oh, what's that? And these days I do need the visual aids to, to read things, so I uh, got my glasses out. It was a receipt from the Liberal Party headquarters for $20. I said, right, explain these two things to him. He said, ah, oh, it's pretty easy, cock. I'm sure that $20 out of my CFMEU membership will go to fund the Labor Party campaign, and I just wanted to balance up the ledger, because not every CFMEU member votes or supports the Labor Party. And as I go around the country and doing factory visits and other things, uh, I had at a shipyard with the Australian Manufacturers Workers Union. A fellow came up, shop steward, he said, Eric, I've been voting for you guys ever since. Uh, 1996 and uh, you'll be getting our support so I don't think all of us union officials are in lockstep with headquarters and with a Labor Party but the trade union movement you know I have and I don't say this by bearing my soul to you but I've never been invited to a trade union conference in all the years I've been shadow minister yet employer organizations religiously invite Bill Shorten and indeed employer representatives. When uh, we launched our policy, the ACTU wrote to me and said, we've got all these questions. I wrote back in detail and said, I'd be happy to sit down with you at an ACTU executive or council meeting and explain it to you. Offer never taken up. And that is how regrettably partisan they are. And no matter what our policy is, they will seek to dress it up as work choices. Enough from me. Thank you very much.